My name is Erin, again, and I'm on staff here uh, at New Life, and I'm also a student at Fuller Seminary, uh, working toward my Master Divinity, and I have the pleasure and the honor of opening the Word of God with you this morning. Um, I've got about 18 months left in my degree, and I'm uh, starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel, and I am so grateful uh, for all the ways that New Life has encouraged and supported and walked with me uh, on this journey. And so, as always, it is an incredible honor to be here with you this morning and to open uh, scripture with you. Uh, so today we are wrapping up our series that we've titled Rise Above the Deeper Work of Renewal. And this series really aims at promoting the concept that in order to rise above the challenges we face, we need to dive deeper with God into who we are, into who God has called us to be, and do that ongoing, deeper work of renewal and healing. And so in the last 30 years in the workplace, these biblical concepts are often labeled emotional intelligence, or EQ. And so these are important biblical concepts that are helpful in navigating a God-honoring life. And over this past month, we've been focusing specifically on four areas of emotional intelligence and how to engage with God to be more Christ-like in very significant ways. And so Pastor Ryan Bogert opened up this series a few weeks ago with a discussion on self-awareness, knowing ourselves better so we can relate better to those around us. So when we know ourselves better, we also learn to know God better and our relationships grow in depth and impact. And then Pastor Juno spoke about motivation, knowing what drives the decisions we make and the things we do. And when we understand why we make the choices we make and do the things we do, we become more discerning and grow in our ability to make good and wise choices. Pastor Ryan Clement last week taught us about self-regulation or self control, the ability to rely on ourselves and on God to recognize what is going on in us and around us and to have control of our actions and our responses. And if you missed any of those sermons, I definitely encourage you to watch them back online through our app. Um, and so today we're going to close out this series and we're going to be talking about the fourth concept of emotional intelligence, which is empathy. And now I know this is a big thing to say, but I truly believe that growing in this area of our emotional development can change the world. <laughs> and it can have a positive influence on our families, our friendships, our workplace, and our relationships. If we as Christians want to have deep, lasting, meaningful influence in our relationships, our communities, and in our world, empathy is one of the elements at the core of that movement. And so this morning we're going to look at what empathy is and a big example of it in scripture. And we're going to talk about what it means in our own lives to both receive and give empathy and why it matters. So what is empathy? In short, empathy is the ability to understand and share in the feelings of someone else. We are empathetic when we enter into the emotions that someone else is having. Even when their experience is different from our present experience, empathy allows us to understand what they are feeling and potentially even feel it ourselves. We are empathetic when we can appreciate the perspective of others even when they differ from our own. Empathy involves four key steps. The first is putting yourself in someone's shoes, looking at things from their perspective even if you don't share it. Sometimes this is easier said than done. Uh, the second is avoiding judgment. Even if we disagree with their perspective, it's a choice that is intentional about leaving judgment out of the equation. The third uh, is recognizing emotion in another person that maybe you felt before. And this is hard work sometimes. We have to dig deep into our own selves and our own experiences to help us empathize and understand what someone else is going through. Uh, and the last key is communicating that you recognize that emotion. And this is a vital step in using empathy to connect with others because it tells others that they're not alone. Empathy 
fosters connection between people. And it's important to note that empathy is not sympathy. There is a difference. Sympathy kind of stands 20 feet away and kind of says, ooh, that's rough. I'm really sorry. I am sorry. Right? I, uh, sympathy says, I'm sorry, and focuses on my feelings instead of yours. But empathy says, I hear you. I am choosing to enter into how you feel even if I don't feel that way myself. Empathy says, I am with you, and we are here together. My five-year-old daughter is an incredible example, little example of empathy. Um, I work full-time. I'm also in graduate school. So there are some days that by the time I get home for the day, I am pretty tired. And so often while my husband cooks dinner and the kids do their homework or play outside, I will lay down on the couch and just kind of close my eyes for a few minutes to reset from the day and um, to make sure I can be present with my family at home. And once in a while, if I'm extra tired, this will lead me to kind of dozing off or snoozing on the couch for a few minutes. Uh, and if without fail, if my youngest daughter sees me sleeping on the couch, she will very intentionally stop whatever she, was, she is doing, and she will go to her room and grab her favorite blanket, and she will cover me with it. Even if it is 95 degrees outside, she will cover me with it. <laughs> and she will grab her favorite stuffed animal, which is a giraffe named Wubby, and she'll lay him down next to me, and she'll tuck me in, and she'll kiss my cheek, and then she'll go back to whatever she was doing before. This is empathy. She is not tired herself. She will probably never admit that she is tired, even if she is tired. But at this moment, she's probably not tired herself. But she knows what it's like to be tired. And she knows what brings her comfort and rest when she is tired. And in her empathy, she understands what I'm feeling. And she can relate to that. She doesn't have to understand the ins and outs of my day job. She doesn't have to understand graduate school or the general stresses of life to empathize with me. Uh, she doesn't judge me or say, stop being tired. Well, once in a while she might say that, but most of the time she doesn't. Um, but she sees the basic human need behind what I am feeling. And in her own sweet five-year-old way, she empathizes with me. And she shows me care and love. And as we read through the Bible, it is absolutely striking how often Jesus responds to others with empathy. Throughout the story of Jesus' life, we see over and over again when others respond to a situation with anger or contempt or judgment, Jesus instead responds with empathy. And so we're going to look at a prominent example of this right now. So if you have Bibles with you or devices and you'd like to follow along, we're in the book of John, chapter 11, verse 1. It will also be on the screen for you. Uh, and just as a note, there are some Bibles on the chairs in front of you. If you need a Bible or you know someone who does, you are welcome to take those with you. So we're in John, chapter 11. And this passage tells the story of a climactic sign of Jesus' ministry. So this is one of the last miracles that Jesus is going to perform before he's killed. He's performed many before this, uh, but this one shows in a very unique way that he has the power to literally give life. And so we're going to be introduced to a few characters here, Mary and Martha, who are sisters, and then also their brother, Lazarus. And these three people are friends of Jesus. And so if you're following along, we're going to start in John 11, verse 1, and it says this. Now, a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when, they heard that, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. So let's pause here for a moment. What is happening here? Jesus receives a message from some close friends that his friend Lazarus is very 
ill. And while there's a sense of urgency to Martha and Mary's message about their brother, Jesus doesn't quite rush off to meet them. In fact, the scripture says he waits two days and then leaves on the journey to go to meet them in Judea. So let's jump down to verse 11. After he'd said this, he went on to tell them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I am glad I was not there so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Okay, sorry, one more quick pause here. This is a moment where we lose some of the nuance of the verse in the translation. So the Greek word here for sleep could have meant either actual death or sleep. So it's actually understandable a little bit more why the disciples would be confused. Uh, But the point here is that Jesus already knows that Lazarus has passed, but he has a plan. So the suspense is building. We're gonna skip down to verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. So let's have another pause here. When Jesus arrives, Mary and Martha are in deep grief. Their brother is already gone. And while tradition was that the grieving family would be at home for the days following the death, Martha comes out to meet Jesus. And she says, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And I believe that many of us in this room have had moments in our lives and we can relate to Martha's sentiment here. How many of us have had moments in our lives where we find ourselves asking God, why didn't you show up in this situation the way that I wanted you to? Why didn't, did you let this happen? Many of us in this room have been through hard times and we have prayed and maybe God didn't answer our prayers the way we had hoped for. Notice here that Jesus doesn't scold Martha for saying these things. And even in her grief, Martha shows great faith in Jesus by expressing that she believes that because of Jesus, Lazarus will one day rise again. She doesn't realize that Jesus is talking about raising Lazarus from the dead right now. She thought he was talking about a future sense. And many commentators and Bible scholars praise Martha for her faith. That even in her grief, she expresses hope that her brother will live again in heaven one day because of Jesus. But notice how Jesus very tenderly responds to both Martha's expression of grief, if you'd been here, this wouldn't have happened, and her expression of faith. I know that he will rise again. And for those of us who are grieving or going through something hard, I think for some of us who've been in the church for a while, Sometimes we buy into the idea that to be a mature Christian, we just need to ignore our emotions. We have hope in Jesus because we know that the pain we experience here in this life is only temporary. And that if we've accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we will one day live in heaven where there is no more crying or tears or pain. And all of this is true, but it doesn't take away pain here on earth. But it does reframe it. We don't mourn as people without hope. We know that one day Jesus will take away all pain and tears and sadness. But for right now, we're still human. And sometimes we still hurt. We don't have to ignore our emotions just because we know the pain of life is temporary. But instead, we can honor our emotions while still holding on to the hope that we know that because of Jesus, better days are coming. We see in this part of the story how Martha feels deep grief while also expressing deep faith and hope. We can allow both to exist in our lives simultaneously. So let's continue on in this story. 
We're going to go down to verse 28. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. That's a powerful statement, friends. Don't miss this one. By the time Jesus arrives, Lazarus has already been gone for four days. And separately, both Mary and Martha say to Jesus, if you'd been here, this wouldn't have happened. These women are feeling the deep, vulnerable pain of loss. And they say to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. Now we, as the reader, we already have the advantage of the foreshadowing earlier in the passage. We know that Jesus' plan is to raise Lazarus from the dead. Jesus already knows what his plan is. He already knows he has the power to do it. But he weeps. Why? Well, the passage tells us, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Jesus models profound empathy for those who are brokenhearted. And for many of us here this morning, I think we need that reminder. For those of us who are struggling, who are tired, who are weary or anxious or afraid or hurt, Jesus sees you. He grieves with you. He has a deep love for you. We don't worship a God who is distant or cold. Jesus models for us that he experiences profound empathy when we experience pain or difficulties in life. Jesus already knew he was going to raise Lazarus again. He said it to his disciples before they even left for Judea. But before he did raise Lazarus from death, he was deeply moved by the pain Mary and Martha were experiencing. He was moved with empathy by their grief, and he grieved with them. He wept out of deep empathy for the pain of those around him, and Jesus grieves with us when we experience pain. And not only are we called to remember that our God is a God who is loving and empathetic toward us, we are also to show that empathy and love to those around us. We reflect the love of Jesus in our world by extending to others the same empathy that God gives to us, by moving beyond our own emotions to enter in and understand the experiences of someone else. And for those of us, uh, some of us may have heard empathy and compassion used interchangeably before, uh, but there's an important difference and a need for both depending on the circumstances. So empathy is the ability to understand and enter into the experiences of someone else. But it's also very important we talk about compassion. Compassion is the word you're going to find consistently in the Bible. And while empathy is the ability to feel what others are feeling, compassion occurs when you allow that empathy to drive you to action for the good of that person. When we show empathy to someone else, we show them how much they matter to us And to God, we validate their experiences. Empathy tells someone, you're not alone. Your existence, your experience, your feelings, they're valid, and you are loved. Compassion is what we experience when we allow that empathy to compel us to action on that person's behalf. Compassion says, not only do I see you and hear you and feel what you are feeling, but I'm also compelled to act for you out of love. Compassion says, I see your pain, and my love for you prompts me to some kind of action. There is a need for both empathy and compassion in our world. 
Sometimes when a friend is grieving, they don't need us to try to fix their pain or their problem. Sometimes the most powerful thing we can do is what Jesus did. Weep with those who weep. There are moments in our lives when the most loving thing we can do for someone is simply to empathize with them, to hear them, to share their emotions, and by doing this, we let them know that they are not alone. But there are also times in our lives when empathy is not enough. And we should allow our empathy to move us to compassion, to advocate on behalf of someone, or to use our empathy to drive ourselves to action for the good of that person. Just a few minutes ago, we heard from Jackie at Forgotten Children, Inc., and FCI is doing incredible work restoring and rescuing victims of trafficking. And they've been through horrific mistreatment and abuse. And hearing their stories should not only cause us to weep for the injustice that they have experienced, but compel us to pray, to volunteer, to donate, to get involved in ways that bring healing and restoration to these women, children, and men who are made in the image of God. This is compassion. Not only do our hearts ache for them, we are compelled to action by compassion. And for many of us, we're going to have other causes that keep us up at night. Those things that we just can't stop thinking about. The areas we feel drawn to get involved in. Right here in our congregation, we have so many examples of compassion. Food distribution ministry, global missions, local missions, foster care, community involvement, serving people experiencing homelessness. The list of causes met with, this compassion, met with compassion in this community is staggering. And sometimes opportunities compassion, for compassion will come up organically in our lives. Uh, many of you know my husband, Leon. We've been married for about 11 years. I'm going to embarrass him a little today. We had our oldest daughter uh, about three years after we got married. And when she was a baby, uh, someone gifted us Disneyland passes for Christmas. And this was before they cost like a zillion dollars. Um, and one of our favorite things to do as a little family would be to just go to Disneyland. We'd walk around with the stroller. Maybe we'd get a coffee. We'd do some people watching. We'd watch a show. And then we'd go home. Uh, and if you've ever been to Disneyland uh, with a baby, you know they have these really amazing baby care centers uh, in each park. And... Um, these baby care centers, they're so great. They have places to feed and change and care for your baby. It's fully staffed. Super great. And so one day we were there, and while I'm caring for Addie, Leon strikes up a conversation with the staff uh, in the waiting room. If you know my husband at all, you know that that is what he's doing everywhere he goes. He makes friends. Uh, and over time, we kind of got to know these staff members' faces, and they began to recognize us. And one day in December, we were there, I was tending to the baby, and Leon overheard a staff member talking to her coworker about how her apartment got so cold that she had to buy a space heater to keep her warm, but it wasn't really helping enough, and she was still cold. Uh, and she'd wish she'd bought an electric blanket instead, but they were too expensive. So if you know my husband at all, you know that upon overhearing this, he was on a mission. And we left Disneyland, and we went to the store that night, and he bought an electric blanket. And the next day, uh, we went back to Disneyland, this time carrying a brand new electric blanket through security, which they didn't really look twice at, which is kind of surprising. Um, why would you bring an electric blanket to Disneyland? Um, and we walked back into that baby care center as a family, and this sweet employee was just completely bewildered as Leon handed her a brand new ex electric blanket, and we went on our way. This was compassion. When Leon heard this person was experiencing being cold in her home, but was struggling to be able to solve that problem, he empathized with that experience, and he allowed that empathy to drive him to good actions for the good of that person. One of my favorite theologians, Henry Nouwen, he had this to say about compassion. Compassion asks us to go where it hurts, to enter into the places of pain, to share in brokenness, fear, confusion, and anguish. Compassion challenges us to cry out with those in misery, to mourn with those who are lonely, to weep with those in tears. Compassion requires us to be weak with the weak, 
vulnerable with the vulnerable and powerless with the powerless. Compassion means full immersion in the condition of being human. So if I'm being honest with you, I have two gut reactions uh, to these words. And the first is, wow, that's a really powerful quote. That sounds really nice. And then my second is, wow, compassion sounds really painful. Why would I ever want to do that? Why would I want to go to a place of pain? Why would I want to mourn or weep or be vulnerable? Popular culture tells us that if something doesn't feel good, you just shouldn't do it. So why would I choose compassion? Why choose to enter into the pain or brokenness or vulnerability of others? Well, I'd like to offer you a couple reasons. And the first is that the love of Jesus compels us to compassion. Many of us are here because we've experienced the radical, life-changing, compassionate love of Jesus Christ. For some of us, maybe you're just exploring or asking questions about faith in Jesus, and that is great, and we are so glad you're here, and you and your questions are welcome here anytime, all the time. But for some of us who've experienced the overwhelming love of Jesus Christ, the compassion of Jesus, we know we will never be the same. And this love drives us to show compassionate love to the world around us. The second is that empathy and compassion allow us to connect in a world that is increasingly disconnected. We were made to experience community real, authentic, vulnerable community. God made us to need each other. Empathy and compassion are tools in our toolbox to fostering real, deep, honest relationships in our friendships, in our families, in our workplaces, and in our communities. So how do we grow in empathy and compassion? I'd like to offer a few suggestions if you are looking to grow or strengthen this area of emotional intelligence. And the first is to listen to people's stories. This is my favorite thing about being in church community together. If you want to grow in your ability to empathize with others, take someone to lunch or coffee and just ask them about their story. Ask them what they've been through in their life. Hearing people's stories add layers and dimensions to our relationships with them that we didn't have before. Stories help us understand why people see the world the way they do. Uh, and the second is to get involved in a cause you're passionate about. If you were listening to Jackie share earlier and you feel drawn to get more involved, you realize I'm really passionate about supporting the work of rescuing victims of human trafficking. Stop by the table and find out more information. Or maybe you're really passionate about food distribution and making sure that families in our community don't go hungry or helping people experiencing homelessness, or global missions, or foster care. Pay attention to those things you just can't stop thinking about. And maybe take that next step in getting involved in one. And the third is to allow others to show you empathy and compassion. This is a vulnerable thing to do, but it is necessary. If we want to become more empathetic, compassionate people in the name of Jesus, we also need to allow others to show us that same empathy and compassion. So be intentional this week. Maybe set a simple goal to plan one meeting with a new friend, coworker, family member, friend, but set up one intentional meeting just to connect with someone else. And be willing to share a little bit of your life with that person. You don't have to share your deepest, darkest secret, nothing like that, but just one intentional step toward authentic connection with someone this week. Or maybe your intentional step is coming up for prayer in a little bit. Usually after the sermon, we'll have prayer and anointing, people available to pray with you. Maybe there's an area of life you need prayer for, and you can take that next vulnerable step to share a little bit of your life and allow us the honor of praying over you. So as we close, I want to go back to the story of Jesus and Lazarus. How does it end? Well, I encourage you to read the rest of the chapter tonight so you can experience the full details of the story. Uh, we'd be here way, way, way too long, and you'd be very hungry if we went through the whole thing. But the scripture says that Jesus, moved by his compassion, goes to the tomb with Martha and Mary in the crowd, and Jesus 
raises Lazarus from the dead in a very dramatic fashion. And Lazarus walks out of the tomb where he's been for the last four days. And he's covered in the cloths that bodies were typically wrapped in for burial. And now don't get me wrong, the point of this story is not that Mary and Martha got what they wanted. That's not it. Jesus does this miracle to show that he is the son of God. And ultimately, it was this miracle that drives the Pharisees and the lawmakers to finally make the decision to kill Jesus and to send him to the cross. And Jesus knew that performing this miracle would get him killed. So while Jesus weeping for Mary and Martha is an incredible picture of the compassion of God, it is ultimately a small part of a much larger narrative that teaches us about God's loving kindness. Because not only does Jesus weep with those who weep, not only does Jesus act with incredible compassion, Jesus showed us the ultimate sign of compassion on the cross. Because in the end, Jesus died on the cross and rose again to forgive us of our sins, restoring us of our brokenness. And there is no greater compassion than this. Jesus, who had done no wrong, laying down his life for ours. Even when our lives seem to be falling apart, even in the moments when we say, God, I've done so many wrong things, how could you still love me? Or God, how could you possibly restore this broken area, this broken relationship of my life? God responds with incredible compassion, the same compassion shown to us on the cross. God says there is nothing that will separate you from his love. There's no circumstance, no choice, no person, no mistake that will keep God from loving you. So as we go this morning, would we carry this reminder that our God is a God of incredible empathy and compassion toward us and that we have the opportunity to show that incredible empathy and compassion to a hurting world. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your goodness. God, we thank you that you are a God who is not distant or cold or separated from us, but God, that you show incredible empathy and compassion to us wherever we are, whatever we have this morning, on our hearts, on our minds, on our shoulders, God, we know that you are present with us. And so, Lord, would you heal us? Would you restore us? God, would you give us the strength to lean into community and to show empathy and compassion and also to receive it? God, would you continue to grow us to be more like you and to impact our world with your love? In Jesus' name.